Hello everyone. Welcome to the Lake Rejuvenation and Management course. This is a collaborative initiative by Bangalore University, Friends of Lakes, Biome and Atri. The purpose of this course is to educate citizens on lake rejuvenation, covering both engineering and environmental aspects. Happy learning. Today's session is going to basically focus on the management part mostly. The first lecture is by Nagish and this is his bio. In this session, we will see the basics of lake rejuvenation process. First of all, we must understand the distinction of rejuvenation versus routine maintenance. Then we consider when to start a rejuvenation project and with what goals. Two. What are the approaches for rejuvenating a lake? If we want to roll back the status of the lake to a historical baseline date, then how to define it? How to reconcile the need to preserve our legacy with the need to develop the area? And how to account for the changing hydraulics of the area, including changing direction of water and also the increase in production of sewage as population grows? And three, how to develop a consistent framework for such rejuvenation projects, so that lakes are not taken up and rejuvenated in a random fashion? How do we decide who the stakeholders are, livelihood versus environment versus quality of life? How to streamline the lake rejuvenation framework and process? How should the upstream and downstream considerations be included? In other words, how to balance the populations living in the catchment area and the command area. How to identify the specific roles that are to be played by a given lake. How to engage the stakeholders, including government agencies and sponsor, and build consensus among them. What happens when there are disagreements and we are unable to reach consensus? Next, let us consider when we need to call for a rejuvenation instead of relying on routine maintenance. There are four cases in which rejuvenation is called for. 1. The quality of lake water degrades beyond a minimum threshold. 2. The health index score of the lake drops below limit. 3. Alterations are needed in the lake to fulfill a specific role of the lake. This typically happens when the lake is assigned a new role. And 4. Specific lake assets need urgent repairs or replacement. Here is the master list of lake assets for reference. The rejuvenation project for a lake can have six different focus areas. 1. The focus of the project is on improving the water quality or desilting of the lake. 2. The focus is on correcting the food chain or adjusting the littoral zone of the lake. 3. The focus is on creating a habitat for specific target group of birds, etc. 4. The focus is on repairs or replacement of specific lake assets. 5. The focus is on removal of encroachment and recovery of lake land. Or 6. The focus is on changing the role of a lake, with a complete restructuring. We can think of at least 10 roles for Bangalore lakes. A lake can play multiple roles at a time. 1. As a freshwater reservoir. Here, the maximum holding capacity and control on water release is desirable. Also, the lake water must not get contaminated. 2. Flood mitigation. Such lake is emptied before heavy rains arrive, and they absorb the flood waters. 3. As a buffer tank where fluctuation in the flow is absorbed by holding the water for some time. 4. As a habitat for migratory or local birds. This involves setting up vegetation for food and nesting of birds. 5. Setting up a biodiversity park for vegetation and birds. 6. Setting up jogging, walking, and biking tracks around the lake. 7. Setting up the lake as a water sports center. 8. Optimizing the lake for fishing, either as a hobby or for livelihood. 9. 
setting up a children's park. And 10. A community center such as amphitheater, hall, etc. Next, we will see a proposed framework for lake rejuvenation and management, in which sweeping reforms are suggested. In this presentation, we will cover the following topics. 1. Why do we have a water crisis? And 2. How to resolve the crisis? We will consider four aspects of the solution. 1. New approach in water budget and water balancing. 2. Engineering efforts required in implementation. 3. Changes required in government organization. And 4. New workflow for lake system management. Let's start with why we have a water crisis. We have two main sources of water, Kaveri water and groundwater. About 45% of our water supply comes from groundwater. Our rainfall actually exceeds these two supplies. But we do not capture this abundant rainwater. After use, most of this water flows out of the city, as sewage. Only a little part of it goes to recharge the groundwater. Thus we draw 700 million liters of groundwater every day, and recharge only a fraction of it. As a result, our groundwater is depleting rapidly. While our water supply will not improve, our growing population will go on demanding more and more water. Thus, by next year, we will have no groundwater at all. If any groundwater is left, it will be unfit for use. We are also polluting what groundwater is left. In short, we will have a 50% shortage of water by next year. And that will take grip of the city gradually, not overnight. How will we deal with this acute water shortage? The only solution is to stop wasting our two largest water sources, rainwater and sewage. Next, we will see the solution, which begins with water budgeting and water balancing. The solution consists of four parts. 1. Do not let the sewage leave the city, treat it and reuse. 2. Do not let the rainwater flow away. Capture it and use. 3. Boost the groundwater recharge with good quality water. 4. Use less groundwater till the water table improves. This is the new water balance, all over the city. So how do we implement that water balance model across the city? We must make a separate water budget for each watershed. Note that we cannot manage this task on the basis of wards or constituencies. Check how much water is needed, and how much water is actually available from different sources. Check if the available water is being contaminated. Launch drives to reduce water consumption. Reuse the treated sewage, mixed with rainwater. The lake will collect rainwater and treated sewage in 3 to 1 ratio. This mix can be supplied to the area surrounding the lake. This is the new water balance, where we have enough water for our needs. But we must carefully monitor the quality of water in the drains, wetlands and lake, because that is the water we will consume. To implement this strategy in the city, we must break down the whole terrain in watersheds, and then manage each watershed. These watersheds will not be contained within specific ward boundaries. To understand this, first look at our water sources across the city. The left picture shows the three valleys, with drains marked in white, and wetlands marked in yellow. The right side map shows our lakes. 
These are our water system assets, they will be used to store the rainwater and treated sewage. This also calls for a paradigm shift in multiple areas. 1. For each watershed, set up a water budget. Account for incoming water and how much water is spent. 2. The water resources will be our lifeline. Therefore we must treat them as our precious assets. 3. Identify all stakeholders in the area, and balance their needs. 4. Involve the public in water resource management. Make all data in public domain. 5. Establish well-defined processes and declare them as public charters. Define metrics for all processes and share the data in public domain. And 6. Streamline the funding for water resource management. Next, we will examine the engineering efforts required in implementing the solution. There are four major engineering challenges. 1. To provide totally separate pipelines for rainwater and raw or treated sewage. 2. To set up a large number of STPs and constructed wetlands required for water treatment. 3. To sink 1 million rainwater harvesting wells across the city. 4. Setting up the local water supply systems that recycles water in each watershed. Note that the overall holding capacity of the city lakes may not be sufficient. In that case, some water treatment may have to be done outside the city limits. In other words, we may need to set up the same infrastructure outside the city. In the previous section, we listed various water assets, which need to be used as a single system. However, the main problem is that these assets belong to different agencies. As a result, they do not plan and manage a unified water system. Therefore, for smooth implementation of the solution, some changes are required in the government organization. Now we will see how a change in the government organization streamlines the process. Set up a central leadership with a single deliverable, which is Integrated Water Resource Management Set up a cross-disciplinary expert team to guide this central water authority. The same team must reimagine the entire workflow and processes for water budgeting and management. All lake-related assets must be designed and managed as a set. This includes stormwater drains, sewerage lines, all STPs, rainwater harvesting wells, wetlands, and lakes. All agencies dealing with water in any form will report to the Central Water Authority. These agencies include Lake Custodians, BWSSB, and KTCDA. Finally, the state government must allocate adequate budget for the water management. It must be recognized that the CSR contribution will amount to 5 to 10 percent at best. Currently, lake rejuvenation projects are taken up sporadically. Even after the rejuvenation, the lake continue to receive sewage. Thus all the effort is wasted. Worse, rejuvenation of the lake does not contribute to the city's water management goals. Next, we will examine the new proposed workflow for lake system management. The process starts with a citywide integrated water management plan. From this, valley wise water management plans and targets are derived. From this, area wide plans and targets, lake wise plans and targets are derived. At this stage, we need to form a lake committee from all stakeholders. This team defines the lake vision document with local aspirations. 
A detailed project report is prepared based on the LakeWise plans and Lake Vision document. This DPR is reviewed by public, and the Lake team deals with all objections. This DPR is passed through a single window clearance system. Based on the approved DPR, tenders are invited. The approved DPR is also used to attract sponsors. The state undertakes to provide the main funds, supplemented by the CSR funds. All details such as scope of work and sponsorship are finalized. The Lake team monitors the progress of the project. The project is cleared stage by stage. As each stage is cleared, its payment is made to the contractor. Timely payments are crucial to ensure that there is no corruption. Once the project is completed, the team switches to day-to-day -day management mode. A separate contract is made to drive the lake system management. We also need to re-engineer all the processes and procedures. We will see the existing shortcomings and the proposed improvements. These changes address four goals. 1. Management of lake system must be asset-based. 2. All stakeholders' needs must be balanced. 3. All stakeholders must be involved actively. 4. Governance in management of government and CSR funds. First, we will see the changes needed to ensure that the management of lake system is asset-based. 1. Lakes are not valued at all. Their value must be counted in terms of assets. 2. Government takes credit for announcing large budget projects, which don't materialize later. Credit can be given only when assets are actually created or rejuvenated. 3. Projects have questionable results. Projects must have specific asset-based targets. 4. There is no accountability for project spending. We must establish asset-wise accounting of spending. 5. Custodians get away with mismanagement of water assets. We must conduct social audit of assets to bring accountability. Next, we will see the changes needed to ensure that all stakeholders' needs are balanced. 1. We don't have a concept of stakeholders. We must identify all stakeholders and their needs. Two stakeholders inviting blocks many projects. Formal team of stakeholders will support the lake project. Next. We will see the changes needed to ensure that all stakeholders are involved actively. 1. Stakeholders are not allowed to get involved in the lake system. We must involve all stakeholders, so that their vigil keeps the water resources in good condition. 2. No experts are allowed in lake management. Experts must be included in local and core teams. 3. Custodians abandon the water resources in their charge. If all stakeholders are involved, they will force rejuvenation and management. 4. Data not captured nor shared to public. Data must be captured and shared online. 5. The data is not reviewed periodically, and no lessons are drawn. We must have regular semi-annual public reviews. This diagram shows the all-inclusive organization needed to manage the water resources. A core committee handles the city-wide issues, while lake-wise issues are handled by the lake-specific team. All the teams are made of all stakeholders and experts. Next, 
we will see the changes needed to ensure good governance of government and CSR funds. 1. CSR is treated as the main and only source of money. CSR is only supplementary fund. Up to 95% of the budget must be funded by the government. 2. The donor is forced to become the executor of the project. Donor is customer for the project. He may not have the capacity to execute the project. 3. The MOU considers that CSR funding is the donor's obligation. CSR is voluntary, ex gratia, and the donor should in full control of his funds. 4. The MOU makes the CSR commitment unconditionally binding on the donor. The CSR installments are tied to results, voidable, and retractable. 5. The donor has to pay penalty for non-payment or delays. There is no exit clause. Donor must not be penalized for non-payment. 6. The CSR funds are invited for a project even before its DPR is approved. If the DPR approval takes long time, the donor's annual CSR budget is wasted. Invite CSR funds for pre-approved projects only. To sum up, we can deal with the water crisis by 1. Uniting all water-related government agencies for integrated water resource management. 2. Water budgeting and water balancing across the city. 3. Building separate pipeline networks to carry rainwater and sewage. 4. Setting up constructed wetlands to treat sewage. 5. Adopting a new workflow for lake system management. 6. Introducing reforms in all processes. And 7. Involving all stakeholders in the water system management. Thank you. So the next uh, session is going to be conducted by Shubha from Bio. Okay, hi everybody. So uh, my name is Shubha and uh, this class is really about how, like we spoke about in the previous presentation, how do we get a group who we are calling the stakeholders, the people who are immediate, immediately affecting the lake or affected by it, how do they come together, take ownership for the lake, have a vision for the lake in the immediate context as well as in a, in a long-term context and then how does it translate into what's called a DPR, that's the detailed project report, which then becomes the framework with which the actual implementation happens on ground. So how really did the, so for which it becomes important for us to think about how really did the lakes come about, what were the functions that they served, who were the stakeholders, how were things working in the past, it's always important for us to know that. And, and then what has happened over a period of time? Why, why do we have to think about it all over again? Is it working well somewhere? Uh, why, why did it happen that over a period of time it was felt that people are not best equipped to manage their own common resources, but we have to look to a private party or we have to look to the government to manage our resources for us. When did that happen? How did that happen? And so in the new paradigm, when we look at it and now we have the government, we have the private entities uh, and we have the community, how do we reimagine these rules? And then come up with what we are calling a lake vision document, which is the collective vision of this group for the lake and then translate it into action. So I'll just slowly kind of walk you through whatever I spoke to you about. Yeah, so uh, there's a short video that you could watch. I'm not playing it now. The link is here as the presentation gets shared. So this is about a lake called Kaikundrahali Kere, which is in the south, southern part of Bangalore. And it's actually true for many other lakes as well. So the way the video starts is when somebody in the city, in, in the middle of buildings and traffic and flyovers, actually observes a place which is so full of dragonflies that she's not able to see a little bit further ahead from her. 
and then it occurs to her in the video her name is priya incidentally and, and this story is not as much about her as much as it is about all of us who are living in spaces in the city we see spaces where there is wildlife there's vegetation we see sometimes that they, there is garbage there that we can observe some of the issues but we, we think these problems are much beyond what we can do something about ourselves and so we step back so here the story goes that she sees these dragonflies she's quite mesmerized she thinks that what kind of place is it and she observes that what had been a lake is now a cricket ground dumping ground and from there on the story moves about where she along with other like minded folks of course a smaller group actually takes ownership collective responsibility for the lake works with the government authorities to actually bring it to the state in which it is now having said that the story is not over the challenge it's not like it's a happy story at the end and perhaps there's no beginning and end because this lake again has challenges of sewage coming to uh, coming into the lake a lot of algal growth and some citizens again have to come together and figure out what appropriate solutions can be so that's also the nature of these commons that because there are various stakeholders coming in at various points in time understanding the history to various extents there is a need to keep keep the storytelling going to tell people what are we doing all of this for and to keep them inspired so yeah if you'll get a chance to watch this video so coming very quickly just a small reminder this holds largely for the southern part of the country but even in some of the northern states depending upon where all the participants are a lot of the lakes while they originate from a spring but in the southern part of the country especially they were mostly made for irrigation so there, there were low lands the water flow in a flow, flowed in a certain path small obstructions were built to hold the water and that water was then used for irrigation it helped when the communities were agrarian uh -huh. they needed the water for irrigation uh, so that's how the lakes came about to be but in, in the same time the functions they also stored uh, served and which are environmental uses were that they had if an area was flooding in the low lying area if the water would come to this lowest area which would be the lake so so the immediate vicinity of the lake would not get flooded which is why it becomes important for us to know what the functions are how do we keep these functions in mind as we think about the lake for the future lakes recharge groundwater so you would typically see that people never took water from the lake directly for drinking or cooking but there would be open wells adjacent to the lake mostly downstream from the lake where there would be extraction of water that would be used for various purposes like it says wells wells were used to access this water for drinking and domestic and um, so that and there, there were also dhobis fishermen uh, grass grew shepherds cow cattle could come and graze by the lake so that's how it was largely agrarian and the users were of that nature and at that time who managed and owned these so there were rulers who kind of ensured that the tanks were maintained they would make grants there were niru gantis so they, these basically were people who managed especially when lakes are in a sequence and the overflow from one lake goes to another they would decide how much water from the lake by lowering the outlet level from where you can draw water from the lake by manipulating that by making it go up or down they could decide how much water can be made available to a village or to another tank or how do you kind of manage the water both for your village as well as the villages downstream so that role was played by this person who's the nirganti and then there was the community village elders who kind of took collective decisions even now in some of the districts adjoining uh, bangalore like kolar when you go you see to a certain extent there is there are these practices of because if a lake is full or not full and there are multiple people downstream of the lake waiting to irrigate their crops and somebody has more land somebody has less land and there is a limited volume of water how do you really distribute these resources distribute the water amongst these various land holding farmers and if you look at it that's really the question in our cities as well if there's ground water it's unregulated and if it is that whoever digs the bore well and whoever has access to the water it belongs to them then in that context for a resource which you can't even see understand measure properly how do you ensure equitable distribution and responsible management i would say it's a little easier for the lakes than for the ground water but that's the real crux of the matter that you need a group to come together and take these decisions then you need the community people who are just involved in the maintenance cleaning desilting and then there is another good interest group because there are people who are dependent on the lake 
for their livelihood. So the way in which they depend on the lake uh, is different. And in a sense, it's just more than that of the community itself. So that's how these lakes were owned and managed. So if it was managed like that, what happened? Of course, we all urbanized and that's what happening as this course is largely about urban lakes. I'm sure it's happening in most of our towns and cities and this is what we see, right? And uh, so, but is it only about the buildings? What's happened to the lakes? What has happened is somewhere we, we don't depend on the lake for our livelihoods. We, we may not know it very well. We may be depending on the lake for our groundwater, but the relationship is not very apparent to us. While the birds and the bees and the grass and the trees are nice to have, we have those resources available to us in our own closed spaces of whether they be apartments or hotels or more. So people are able to find entertainment in various parts of the lake. So perhaps all of that, but we just dwell on it a little bit. So for instance, if you look at this lake, this is uh, the Bellendur Lake in Bangalore. I, some of you may have read about it. Uh, you can see that over the years, while multiple streams would strain, would drain into the lake over a period of time with buildings, urbanization, these channels got broken and water was not, as much water was not coming into the lake itself. And if at all, we'll go further on it. And what happens is, so the area where we had drains like this, which were natural channels through which water flowed, but because there was a pressure on the land available, many of these drains have now been concreted and what we call box drains have been built. And there is no, and on the floodplains, because the river is not flooding at all times, people have started to build closer and closer to the water bodies. On top of that, there is solid based dumping, wherever there's a culvert, there's a road, it becomes an easy place, whether it's a drain or the lake, is becomes a dumping ground for both uh, domestic solid waste, construction waste. So there's a whole lot of debris dumping that happens. And the much like the previous slide, that's what really happens to the cascade system over a period of time with, uh, with a kind of fragmentation of the catchment itself. In addition to the solid waste, we also have now wastewater, treated, untreated wastewater flowing into the lakes, which causes foaming. And at the and also similarly, when water does not flow into the lake, we have the cases of uh, lakes going dry. So an approach that has been adopted sometimes is to say that if in our drain there is wastewater. So what's happened is with these catchments getting fragmented, in many cases, unless there is a very extreme rainfall event, a sufficient volume of water is not able to come to the lake at all. So the lake really never ever fills up. So there are still certain lakes like that. That may not be the only reason. There are certain other reasons as well. But that's something that has been observed. Now, in addition to that, when you take a call to not let in wastewater into a lake or wastewater mixed with rainwater, some of the lakes are suddenly left with little or no water at all. So that's just an example. Not taking a call. We, we'll speak further about how it should be. So... What really happens as a result of all of this is that livelihoods are lost. You, If there is no water in the lake, the fishermen can't fish over there. You've lost the resource which would otherwise have recharged your groundwater. That, that resource is not available to you. And the space is also lost because where, once the lake is not uh, in a position that many people actually want to come to it. And if it's a place for some kind of illegal activities, you feel unsafe. So the space is also lost to the larger community. And that's what really happens as we disengage from the lake. And suddenly the lake becomes a liability. We all know it belongs to us. We might know there is a potential, but the problem seems so large and uh, the lake becomes a liability. Yeah, so when the lake is a liability, you have fish kill, you have foam. Now, what, what can we do? Are there small things we can do? How do we come together as an individual, as a collective? How do we bring these groups together? And most of these things are a lot easier said than done. Sometimes it's a lot easier to have a project plan to say, I'm going to build a bun, so much cement, concrete, whatever, stones. And that's how I go about building it. But to get people to come together, to think that that's something that they want to do and to agree on it over a long period of time. And not just people, people, government authorities, businesses, establishments close to the lake, to get all of them to come together and reconnect and reimagine their lake. So this is just a photograph of where there was, there's a lake called Halnaik and Hali in, again, Southeast Bangalore, which is still rather dry. But at that time, one of the reasons we observed was because the inlet drains were blocked with a lot of solid waste and there was wastewater flowing into the lake. A lot of changes were done and that rain 
the lake actually did fill up. There are other issues with the lake, but that's just an image to highlight the kind of cleaning activities that was undertaken by involving all segments of society. So now if we reimagine our lake and currently see what are the new uses that have come in. So somewhere where we use the lake as a place for recreation, whether it be walking, boating, whatever, that there's a community use for it. There still are environmental uses for it because uh, it lowers the ambient temperature, there's groundwater recharge, um, there are there are birds, there's biodiversity that comes in. Wetlands actually treat the wastewater also to a certain extent and they help against flood control and provide a place for storage. Uh, livelihood uses have, especially in urban lakes, have become, th there are certain kinds of livelihoods itself that are encouraged. For instance, there is a lake, but not everybody can fish in it. The lake is given out on contract and only a particular fisherman is allowed to fish in it. And uh, how, how should that be carried out? What are the calls on that is what we shall discuss. So here, something that I already covered, but we could take a look at it, just to say what are the kind of functions that a lake serves and uh, yeah we shall spend some a minute you all can take a look at it and now if we look forward and say if those are the functions in the modern context and there are no rulers so to say or there is no nirugunti and there are in a way no village elders but there are elders and youngsters amongst us and some of the farmers fishermen grazers are still there while Perhaps it's not a great idea to let the cow to come to the water to graze. There are uh, people who own cattle that come cut grass and take it for their cows. So that could be a way. And now CSR seems to be one source because to as much as to set right a lake, you need people participation, thoughts, ideas, commitment. You need the money as well. So there could be a certain amount of money patronage that comes from corporates. BBMP really decides in each uh, state or city that there is the owner of the lake or there is the uh, there is the authority who, who has authority over the lake who takes final decisions for the lake that there, there is the community still stays we have to make sure that the community that comes together is made up of as diverse a group as possible so that we are able to take into account various considerations uh, so that's important and then there are Fortunately, some of the lakes which are still there in very peri-urban areas, there are farmers who are benefited when uh, lakes are filled with wastewater. Then the fishermen are there at most lakes, except for some lakes that are now taking a call to say, we don't mind for individuals to come and fish at the lake, but we don't want the lake to be given out for a commercial fishing contract. And what implications does that have? We'll cover that as well. And uh, this just puts it in perspective that there are some institutional stakeholders. The names may vary depending on the state. You have a forest department, you have a fishery department, you have a pollution control board. So there are all these organizations which are institutional in the blue color. And in most lakes in all parts of urban India, you have this right side in orange. Those are all our non-institutional stakeholders as well. So what we're real, so far the response in, in the recent past, the responsibility for the maintenance of the lake has largely stayed in the institutional space. We are trying to see how we can bring the orange spaces into that as well. Yeah, so that's about the custodian agency. Uh -huh. now, now, this is an important part that we can discuss briefly. It's like when we have multiple stakeholders, there will, and like we acknowledge, there are different functions. There are different people who depend on the lake for various functions and that makes the management or decision making all the more difficult. So I'll just give you a few examples. So in some of the lakes, a call was taken that uh, or, or rather, let's say a call was not taken, but people felt that if there are fishermen and who come and fish most of the fish out of the lake, then the birds will not have as much fish for them to come and eat. So what could otherwise be a biodiversity hotspot or what we call our own Ranganti Titu in Bangalore, just by having fishermen, you, you would kind of ensure that as many birds are not coming to the lake anymore. But what was also realized is that it's really the fishermen who in his interest brings fishlings and leaves them in the lake. And if he were to not do that, 
the the birds are also coming there for the fishes and while it's good to have natural fishes they take a certain um, not to take a call again either ways and we we'll discuss the details but the lake left to itself takes a lot of time to have sufficient fish to attract a sufficient number of birds so in lakes where there is a fishing contract we do observe you, you cannot you will have to try to see what it would be in the other case but a fair number of fishes are able to come to the lakes simply because there is a lot more fish accessible to them as well and in such cases the fishermen also then realize the value of the birds coming over and make sure that they don't overfish but actually take into account the kind of uh, food fishes that would be required for the birds as well similarly some of the other examples that i can take is uh, some of the lakes have taken a hard call to say that you cannot have a path that goes through the lake and uh, for for traffic or even for cyclists uh, or the lake has strict timings whereas now some people are asking can we have the lake open at all times because in the city we don't have other spaces to go so this could be an open space that's available to more people or uh, by allowing for me to take my cycle across the lake i'm actually reduce otherwise if i had to take the main road and go i may take out a car so i'm reducing the traffic on the road can i please be given permission to take my cycle across the lake so how and which is also a valid request but it's also known that if you keep the lake open at all times it does reduce certain kinds of biodiversity because some of you who would have had, had an opportunity to visit lakes during non visiting hours lakes open up in the morning at around 5 o'clock cl close for a a bit in the middle uh, during lunch time and then open again at 4 o'clock so the the birds and the flora and fauna at the lake actually flourishes a lot more when there aren't as many people at the lake so how do you take a call and how do you prioritize and hence take those decisions and more importantly whatever decision you may take it's it's not the it may not be the perfect decision but how do you work within those imperfections but agree as a group to to take a particular discussion in certain lakes where the fish where the lake dries up because there is no water in the lake in the summer season and because there is a fisherman who's taken the fish fishing on contract in the lake and his fishes will die he requests that treated waste water be let into the lake uh, but the apartments who are in the vicinity and have treated waste water are just a little hesitant to take that chance because they worry that if the fish were to die would they be held responsible would the pollution control board give sufficient sanction for something like this to happen and is it their problem at all so what really happens is with these kinds of conversations you can already see why so um, the, the, the everybody's i wouldn't say expectation or their imagination of the lake is slightly different and in some lakes it's also accommodated by you have a separate social zone or a conservation zone in the social zone you have all your gym or whatever it is play things play spaces for people or a gazebo amphitheater but in the conservation zone you you make sure that access is limited and not as many people can go to that part so it can be managed in various ways but what has to be thought of is that there are trade offs lakes are multifunctional different stakeholders have different expectations and we need to see how do we balance all of this so here is the process of now now while all of that given the challenges of uh, encroachment channels getting broken up solid waste liquid waste and uh, the different expectations of people it might seem quite daunting at times to see what is it that i as an individual can even start to do where do i start it's pro probably a whole lot easier if i if i just catch somebody and when we say csr um, is it about handing over the lake to somebody else are they doing the implementation why there is merit in taking on the designing and the thought process with the community itself yes yeah, so the process of bringing people together what can i do so we'd like to keep this simple don't think too much just start doing i'll uh, pause a little bit on this slide because there's a fair bit of text uh, you can spend some time reading it so the overall ideas don't think of it as a large problem get people together volunteers and small activities like a solid waste collection drive uh, or just meeting up at the lake regularly watching to see if there is any uh, illegal activity happening communicating it to the custodian 
communic connecting with other lake groups that are there in the city and learning from what they have done, making a map of your lake to see where is the inlet, outlet, to kind of document everything that you see. Th these are all very simple steps to get started. Um, as you see it as a space for getting people together, make sure that you bring as varied, if there's a government school in the neighborhood, try and see that those children are also coming in. If there are slum children, can you involve them in some way as well? If, if there's a lower income settlement, make sure that they are also involved to the extent possible. These cleaning up activities, keep it small, but make sure that a fair bit of that happens. And, and then when we kind of, uh, these are all some more choices of sometimes there are photography, you can do a imagine your lake kind of uh, painting competition, but all of this is not going to fix the lake, it makes sure that the people come together. Once the people come together, here's what you can do, get, find the agency, get together all the stakeholders and discuss the more fundamental questions. So uh, many times in our lakes, we are a little... Uh, and again, not to say that those are not fundamental, what often takes over are the social uh, zone activities that take over and which are much easier for us, us to imagine and make happen. So it's much easier to build up a gazebo or an amphitheater than actually making sure that the inlet channels are clean and clean water comes into the lake. Or to make sure that there is, a, if there is wastewater coming into the lake, how do you regulate the levels at which the water can come into the lake? So those become, so try and discuss those fundamental questions about what you want for your lake to be like, what kind of water can it hold? And do take support from the other lake groups. So this, yeah, just an image to kind of highlight that. And uh, so the same thing, what does the lake mean to us? If we don't know something about the lake, what are the things we don't know? Who are the experts? And you, you would have met a lot of experts during the process of, uh, uh, during this course itself. And then how do we figure out what's best for our lake? Um, so these are just some instances of people coming together. But I think these are the principles uh, that make a lot of sense. Elena, you may have heard of it. About So what's really happened with our commons is that while communities used to come together and manage their commons together, somewhere when that social fabric or the dependence on those commons, it doesn't have to be a lake necessarily, broke and people, the easier approach, or it was assumed by not just normal people like us, but by economists and more learned people in the world, that it can only be managed either by governments, it can be managed top down, or it has to be handed over to a public, private authority for management, which is why we had either privatization or the BBMP taking care of more of the lakes. So in such a context where you're going to get a large group of people with varied interests to come together, what are the rules that we can hold for them to come together? So there are a few that I shall quickly run through, but it's useful for you as students to look them up separately for managing a commons. So anybody who is like whoever is making the rules should be part of the group that's going to be following the rules as well. If the rules are going to be broken, there has to be some kind of sanctions for the people who are violating. Then if there is dispute, there should be very fast and easy dispute resolution. You do, it doesn't have to be very large. So if it's a fisherman and somebody jogger, they should be able to meet and th there should be an authority that's made up of as wide a group as possible that's able to take decision quickly and at low cost. Yeah, and, and there are systems such that within the group itself, there are people monitoring each other's behavior. And what I've seen is WhatsApp to a certain extent, and increasingly you can include all uh, in one of the lake groups, the fishermen, the lake gardener, the BBMP, the lake, uh, the, the trust that manages the lake citizens are all in the same WhatsApp group. So that could be one way, but, but the idea is we really have to figure out ways by which the collective is able to come together, uh, form the rules, make sure rules are adhered, uh, hand out sanctions if required, all of that. So we have to create consensus on the purpose of the lakes. One way to go about it is by doing what we call a lake visioning exercise. I'll briefly run through the steps of what it includes. We spoke about it already. I think you need to know who are your stakeholders. How do you imagine your physical vision of the lake? What functions will the lake serve and what are the rules? that you're expecting for people to follow at the lake. So this is will broadly kind of constitute the vision that you have for the lake. How would you go about doing it? 
So it can be seen as as a single meeting, a series of meetings. Uh, but before that, some prep work has to be done. It would be good if the core group that's going to run this exercise goes and sees some other rejuvenated lakes. I speaks to them to understand what their goals were, where did they reach, what challenges did they have. Then at the other side, you identify all your participants who are going to come uh, to this. Uh, to the lake visioning meeting you can reach out to any other external lake group if they would like to participate and share their experiences at the nalur hali lake uh, uh, an activity of this nature was carried out and also walk around the lake enough to try and identify different stakeholders um, you need people to document these meetings it's good if you can have an artist who will take people's imagination and make a visual representation of that and you can also create a context setting presentation so that when uh, when the meeting starts you're able to set a context for the lake and then everybody is on the same page and you can take it forward from there you can get some uh, in many of the lakes what we've seen unknown to people there are experts who know of historical significances or biodiversity there are some rare species that are found only at certain lakes so if you're able to get an expert of that nature a tree expert a bird expert to come and point those things out to you those are good because post rejuvenation you would want to know what really happened uh, in some of the lakes they've identified uh, stones of historical significance and things like that so if you can get somebody to do that that would be good during the meeting uh, make sure there is a fair bit of time and people are able to contribute completely during that meeting. So the first thing can be where you put the context setting presentation. You could also share it as pre-reading material. Uh, then you can, even this could be pre-reading material where you already circulate to the people how other lakes have been rejuvenated. And then using what we are calling the stakeholders agree on the functions of the lake, the physical elements, the rules at the lake, the elements of the lake. And also in this process, how are you going to collect inputs and how do you take the collective imagination of all the participants? And knowing that there will be contentious points, not everybody is going to agree. You, you need to figure out or if some things are disagreed upon, you need to document it such that you can reach out to that document at a later point in time and see how you're going to be able to resolve it. So get everybody's inputs together, put it on a whiteboard. If there's an artist, you can uh, put it out as a visual representation and then communicate that vision back to the people. And after the meeting, make sure there is a smaller group that is able to look at these documents, able to refine, iterate and take responsibility for the vision itself, share it continuously, incorporate feedback to the extent possible. If, have, if possible, have a bunch of subsequent meetings to get everybody to more or less agree or whatever is disagreed upon, make sure it's all documented. Rules like we spoke about is important. Are there going to be, will there be pets allowed at the lake? What would be the timings? And in, in every state or city, the municipal authority imposes their own timings as well. So you would most, there are some rules that you would have to adhere to, but there could be some choices that you can make. Yeah, so the, there are some examples here that have stated, are you going to allow cycling? Uh, uh, in, in certain lakes, they do not allow institutions to come in for any kind of measurements. Are you going to allow that? So once all of these rules are clear, then this lake vision document becomes the input for what is called the DPR or the detailed project report. And I shall walk you through normally what the DPR contains. It's a, it's a document that's very focused on the implementation of the physical infrastructure. What that has is uh, normally it will tell you where the lake is. It will point out the immediate neighbors of the lake, where the inlets are, what the outlets are. For every lake, the catchment, that is the area from where the water flows into the lake is very important to be identified because that gives you a sense of the volume of water that could come to the lake, the quality of water that come, could come to the lake. And if there are there is any activities that's happening in the catchment, which is going to affect this quality or quantity, you have a fair handle on it. So it's important to know the catchment of the lake. The DPR normally has this information. The consultant comes up with a concept plan for the lake. That, that plan normally, because it's not taken any inputs from the citizens per se, the emphasis is more on the bund, the kind of bund that will be created, the amenities, the pathway, the walking path. So that becomes, infrastructure becomes an important part of that concept plan. Details are given for each of the structures. It's what the government will use to, to be able to implement the structures that are 
wire. So that could be, for instance, in this case, there's the example of a gate that's given. So things are detailed out to a large extent. For, there is description for each of the uh, physical infrastructure items that are going to be built. It could be a fence uh, surrounding just the water body, surrounding the larger lake, the culverts, details are given for everything that's going to be implemented. As an interested person, if you're working with the lake group and if the DPR exists, it's good for you to take a look to understand if the consultant has really considered your lake at all or what has he or she considered when putting this DPR together. Then they, they have a detailed cost estimate for each of the items, a cost is worked out. And then the overall cost for lake rejuvenation is also worked out. And that's what it looks like, where they'll give you details for how much is it going to be for site clearing, de-weeding. So each of the improvements, you make sure that everything has been considered. So that's very simply to tell you what are the components of the DPR. So the DPR is focused on coming up with the plan that the contractor can then take forward for implementation. Largely, while we spoke of the Lake Vision document and the DPR, it's really, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, the green image, and then there's the white image. So the BBM, the lake authorities typically look at the lake like what the green image tells you. So their board is about, they, they're very, don't let sewage, no smoking, no alcohol, no pets, no plucking. So it's all about all the things you can't do at the lake. If you have a problem, call this number. This is the lake timing. So it's a very, and it doesn't tell you anything about the lake itself. Are there birds coming to the lake? What kind of trees grow there? Who are the people who are interested? How large is this lake? What's upstream? What's downstream? That that thought itself is not there. And which is really sometimes the, the uh, problems, I would say, with the DPR. Whereas the image on the right-hand side has that information. And you can spend close to half an hour just looking at that to know and understand your lake and its immediate uh, context vicinity better so that you're able to participate so one of the even putting up a board like this or a better version of this is always very recommended for every lake multiple such for larger lakes so for further information you can write to us at water at biomesolutions.com there is a website we run which is called urbanwaters.in uh, the one that is most populated in that right now is bengaluru.urbanwaters.in. There is also a tumukuru.urbanwaters.in. The plan is to include each city in the country into the site. And the way the site is structured, it speaks about the water story in each city. Where do you get your water from? How many people? What happens to wastewater? It also about the water bodies that are there. And how can you do something to improve the state of the water bodies or the groundwater? What are the regulations? Whom do you get in touch with? Who really are the service providers for each of these services, whether it be lake rejuvenation or lake water quality measurement? So there is a bunch of resources there. So you can take a look at the site. It's called bengaluru.urbanwaters.in. And if there are further queries, you can also write to us. So with that, thank you. Thanks a lot.